All right, everyone, good morning and uh, welcome to our workshop on Mad Games. Uh, and this is a workshop on uh, multi-agent dynamic games. Uh, I, I am one of the co-chairs. I'm Rahul Mangharam from University of Pennsylvania. And uh, we have uh, Professor Venkat Krovi over there, uh, Hongri Zen. And uh, Johannes Betts uh, is also a co-organizer. He wasn't able to attend uh, for personal reasons uh, this, uh, this year. Uh, and uh, but but we are very excited. We have a really exciting uh, day ahead of you. It's packed with uh, over uh, nine different invited talks and thirteen contributed papers. So you'll have a lot of uh, interesting ideas coming through. Um, as obviously this is a workshop day, so we want it to be very interactive. So keep asking questions. Uh, and uh, this is the much more informal than the conference day. So we want you to actually, uh, you know, ask all sorts of questions here, right? So, uh, and so, so one thing you can see, we are also from very different backgrounds from, you know, mechanical, uh, automotive, theoretical, uh, and uh, formal methods, uh, and, uh, and cyber physical systems. But uh, the idea for this workshop is really to, you know, look at you know game theoretic approaches in multi-agent reinforcement learning look at uh, what does it mean to have you know totally independent fully autonomous uh, multi-agents that can adapt evolve uh, interact and then and and do this kind of in, in a cooperative manner and do it with coordination but even in very competitive settings so can how do you effectively have teams of cooperating agents in these competitive settings and then we want to look at the theoretical underpinnings of you know this kind of interactions and and how how do roles happen how do we go from sim to real uh, transfer for multi agent systems and then to also look at uh, you know the asymptotic sort of uh, thresholds of this kind of cooperation and how effectively cooperation can help in the outcomes of these right so um, so today we have a, a very uh, distinguished uh, panel of uh, invited speakers from uh, uh, people uh, who have been working on you know uh, dynamic games uh, for the last 30 years to people starting out in their careers but with very exciting new ideas and new approaches and uh, the other difference with you know the speakers that we have and the contributed papers is that the uh, is is that the people uh, they they come from different backgrounds. It's not there are obviously folks from robotics, but even from economics, from optimization theory, uh, and uh, from uh, aero astro, uh, and also just from pure uh, machine learning side of things. Right? So, uh, so so this is the plan for today. So we will we will start off with uh, a first our invited speaker session, and we will. Uh, have uh, four talks in that session and then break for a, have a coffee break, which will just be outside over here. And uh, then we will have a very rapid fire round of six uh, papers for the contributed papers. Uh, some are in person, some are virtual, but we will coordinate that effectively. So you can just see where you are scheduled. The same schedule is on our website. Oh. And uh, <clears throat> then after we'll break for lunch, and uh, hopefully in lunch we can you know have a uh, lot more discussions uh, and um, and then we will continue with our second invited session with uh, five uh, different talks uh, and uh, again spanning a, a variety of these themes and then have a coffee break and then a second session for the contributed papers so two invited sessions and uh, two contributed paper sessions the second one will be um, with seven papers here and then we'll wrap up for the day uh, uh, by before 5.30 with that, right? So, and then if uh, people are interested at that point, you want to go out for dinner, uh, we'd be very happy to. So, uh, so, so I'll just give a quick uh, intro to our speakers. I think Nancy is not here yet uh, because she was flying in from Cornell. And so she said that she's just doing a day trip for this workshop, but she'll probably join us a little later. So, uh, uh, Yana has happily volunteered <laughs> to be the first speaker, but uh, but I think it's it's very apt because she spans uh, you know uh, quite a, a a range of you know looking at 
you know, applied formal methods for both the specification and synthesis, you know, of these policies for controllers, but with these safety and performance guarantees, right? So, and then and applied to all of the autonomous, you know, areas that we are very excited about on ground, in the air, uh, and, and looking at. So she's an associate professor from uh, KTH, uh, from the division of uh, robotics, perception, and learning. So without uh, any further delay, welcome, Yana. Thanks so much, Rahul. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. This is a bit of a surprise, but uh, <laughs> uh, let me get into it, I guess. Um, okay, so um, thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, I think that, um, as Rahul said, my research spans quite a bit of, uh, of uh, things, but uh, the core is informal methods. So I'm really driven by, this doesn't work, never mind. This is not either. Oh yeah. Okay. So my work is driven by the question: How can we ensure that robots work as expected? How can we make sure that they are autonomous and safe and efficient? And when I say make sure, I really want to have some theoretical proofs next to the empirical evidence that things go as expected. So my background is actually in formal methods in theoretical computer science. So the, uh, the approach that we take there is that formal methods are just a uh, means, a rigorous means to specification, analysis, and verification and synthesis of behaviors. Traditionally, it was applied in computer science uh, to verification of uh, processors and programs and uh, code. And now we are trying to move with these techniques to robotics exactly to see whether we can guarantee something about our robots. So just so that we get on the same page, what is this formal synthesis and how it works? So it started about uh, around 2008, 2009, when uh, some of the pioneers brought these uh, topics into robotics. And we basically start with a system and we start with an objective. We want something, the system to do something. So our system can be a robot in some work workspace and our objective can be something like to patrol the offices. What we do is we model the system somehow. It could be differential equation or whatnot. But typically, these differential equations and continuous dynamical models are very difficult to tame together with these logical principles and in the formal methods framework. So that's where we come up with some sort of abstraction, some sort of discretized uh, representation of our robot in environment. And our objective is specified in some sort of temporal logic. So if I want to say patrol offices A and B, I'm going to create a formula that says GFA, GFP. G stands for globally or always. F stands for future or eventually. So what I'm really doing is saying always eventually go to A, always eventually go to B, which is exactly the same as saying keep patrolling offices A and B. So with these temporal logics, we can have uh, such advanced uh, objectives for the robots to do. And then it's both the model or the abstraction of the model and the temporal logic spec go to formal synthesis framework. And we, from formal synthesis framework, this is basically a set, a family of algorithms, a family of approaches that can algorithmically give you a correct by design time. And this is working quite well in a number of settings, especially when um, when uh, you know a lot of things, when you are in a lab and so on. Sometimes we also get there is no correct by design plan. And there can be multiple reasons for that. One, you simply can't with your robot achieve that objective. Second, the uncertainty is so high that you cannot really say for sure that this is a correct by design plan because there are these uncertain elements in the environment and uh, and uh, you don't know what they will do and how they will play into this. So when it comes to single agent settings, we have this beautiful framework. As I said, it works many times. And when we try to bring them to multi-agent settings, uh, 
there are some challenges to that. One of the challenges is humans in the loop. So when we have formal synthesis and when we have proofs and everything is nice, and then we get people, people is something that is very difficult to build proofs around. Uh, so that's one of the challenges that we have there. Second is when we take a look at multi-agent systems as multi-robot systems, we have some issues in terms of scalability. Of course, I could model my whole system, my multi-agent system uh, as one model, but then there would be exponential growth in the state space and we would be facing challenges in computation. So <clears throat> let's look at uh, the human in the loop synthesis first. So imagine that we have a robot and then we have the human. The human is not really, maybe not even collaborating with the robot or it is, or, or he or she is. Uh, there are pedestrians when the car drives, there, there are also passengers when the car drives. So a lot of robotic systems that we have out there do interact or coexist with people. And when it comes to formal methods, to having guarantees that systems work as expected around people, there have been a bunch of different approaches taken. One of them is to consider the worst case behavior. So what we do here is basically we say the human is adversarial, the human can do uh, everything they want, and they are proactively working in the system. If I can guarantee, if I, I can draw some guarantees in such situation, uh, then I can for sure draw some guarantees. Uh, so um, this is a nice thought, but this is exactly one of these examples where we often get there is no correct by design plan. The whole procedure is very conservative. You are creating very harsh assumption on the human for your robot. So another approach uh, that I that have been taken around when it comes to provable guarantees in human robot collaboration is the moment that things start getting hard and your robot cannot guarantee to do what, what it's supposed to do, you hand over the, to the human. You get rid of the responsibility and you hand over to the human. And we have these things like in semi-autonomous driving. You're driving on a, in a car. Uh, and as long as uh, everything is coming with high certainty and you're on the empty street with uh, just uh, two lanes, the car is happy. And then suddenly when things start happening, you know that the car just starts saying like, take over now, take over now, put your hands on the wheel. This is another approach that we can take to guarantees in human robot interaction. Another thing is that in formal methods, there have been also some work that was about giving feedback to the human. Um, and now the human would be in the role of the user who said to the robot what the robot should be doing. So for instance, saying, I can't do that. You asked me for too much. Just change what you want from me, change the specification, and then we can try to figure it out again. Um, so those have been the approaches so far. And what we try to do is view this a little bit differently. So we are trying to view the uncontrollable elements as non-adversarial and uh, advise them only when completely necessary. Uh, so that way we can obtain guarantees under the assumptions that the advice is followed. So let me give you an example. Imagine that you are a pedestrian and there's an autonomous car and the autonomous car tells you, well, cross the road only if there is a green light. If there is a green light, then I can guarantee safety. That's perfectly fine assumption. We can also have an assumption that the autonomous car says like pedestrian, do not cross the street ever. And that's also a perfectly fine assumption if the pedestrians are never going to cross the road. I'm very sure that the autonomous car can be designed in a way that, that it doesn't hit the pedestrian. But some of these assumptions that we impose on people are a little bit harsher and some of them are more relaxed. So there needs to be some sort of distinguish uh, between which advice is appropriate, which advice is less limiting to the humans in the loop. So 
what we did is having this kind of philosophy in mind, we tried to boil it down to some math. So we started taking a look first at very simple scenario where we had something that we call safety game. So this would be a two player turn based game. We would have a set of states. Um, the squares are protagonists. That's my robot. That's what we can control. The circles are a human. And that's, uh, that's the uncontrolled part, the adversary. And the safety winning condition would be here just to stay in the green area uh, and not to go to the blue one ever. And when I look at the game, I see that whatever the protagonist does, if S1 chooses to go through UP1 or UP2, they end up in adversary state that can bring the whole system into one of the blue states. And this is something that we didn't want to do. So what we strive to do is really find a strategy together with a mapping from the adversary state to forbidden inputs. So I'm trying to tell the adversary who is really not an adversary because that's a flexible human who doesn't want to the robots to screw up, right? So I'm telling the, the human, I'm telling the, um, uh, the adversary which are forbidden. So let's say that I forbid UA3 and I forbid UA5 and UA4. And in this situation, under this advisor, under this assumption, I can keep the whole system in the winning set of states, in the safe states. So this is, this is what we call a good advisor. A good advisor is one that keeps the system in a safe region. Now, another thing that I mentioned is that we have to think about what is appropriate advisor. And here we define formally something that we call level of limitation. In our case, this was first case, long-term average of the number of forbidden inputs along the place induced by the best case winning protagonist strategy. So basically different, different kind of uh, advisors here, different kind of sets of those red edges of those forbidden inputs will have different levels of limitations depending on how many times you really have to impose these restrictions. Now, the problem mathematically would be given a two player game and a safety winning condition, find the, find the least limiting good advisor and the corresponding optimal protagonist winning strategy. And to make the long story short, uh, we can find a nominal advisor by ba basically doing backwards reachability from the unsafe states. We can find least limiting advisor that is always an extension to the nominal advisor. So we managed to find a lemma that says like any good advisor is going to be an the no, is going to contain the nominal advisor plus some edges on top of that, which is very convenient because it gives us the space where we should be looking for the least limiting one, and then the rest finding the winning situation, the the winning uh, strategy for for the protagonist is basically a reachability game. So that went well. So we managed to figure it out. But what I want to say is that I promised you these fancy, complex objectives, right? So far it was safety. Uh, sure, we want to keep our robots safe, but we want to make them do something as well. So now in the formal synthesis framework, we are moving towards uh, some temporal logic specification. So for instance, we may be interested in things like keep patrolling the three offices or Whenever you spot danger, go directly to the staircase and wait for all clear signal before continuing. This one, I would say, as always, if there is danger, then the next step should be staircase until all is clear. Hmm? Or make sure to recharge at least every 10 minutes. And I would say that as always, eventually between 0 and 10 recharge. Or I can even... Uh, try to say stuff like at all times, stay within five meters from the Wi-Fi router. And then I would say something like always the distance between robot and the router is smaller or equal than five. 
The first two ones are in linear temporal logic. The third one is in an extension called metric interval temporal logic. And the fourth one, we need signal temporal logic for that. And with, with these logics, we can, for instance, capture interesting things like traffic rules. You should be staying in right lane and you shouldn't be en uh, entering construction zone. And with those advanced logic like STL, signal temporal logic, we can even be uh, encode things like uh, responsibility, sensitive safety. Um, so we have the formal expression of these um, requirements. Now I showed safety and I'm gonna show what we did for LTL uh, F and the uh, MITL and STL are currently in the future work bucket still. So for LTL, we managed to, to come up with similar results as we did for safety. So for, uh, uh, for LTL specification, what we do is we go through something that's called automata theoretic approach. We translate them to deterministic finite automaton. Uh, our robots is this time gonna be modeled as MDP to include some kind of uncertainty from the environment. And what we get is a stochastic game with reachability goal. The nice part about LTLF was that we were actually able to boil it down to reachability in the end of the day. From that stochastic game, we get two types of advisors. One is safety. That's what you saw already. That's like in this state, do not do this action. And one is fairness. And fairness advisor basically says at some point, you are going to have to take this action so that we can all move on. So that's enforcing uh, liveness properties. Now, um, so we have safety advisor and we have fairness advisor. And I was I named this talk safety in HRI. And when it is HRI, it, there has to be a user study. There has to be the human. So we ran a user study. So my, my PhD student, Georg, that you saw on the previous figure, he uh, implemented this as, a, as an um, Amazon Turk user study. There was a little game and the human and the robot were just navigating using the arrows and and uh, they were trying to make some hamburgers. So to create a hamburger, you need to pick up all the all the ingredients, then you need to assemble and deliver the burger. The rule of the game is that they should never reach into the same tray for safety reasons. The human and the robot should not operate in the same tray. And at the same time, uh, the robot was not really able to squeeze the ketchup bottle. So there they, the robot needed help from the human and that was our liveness requirement. Um, and then the performance of this game was evaluated under time limit. So there was something like one and a half minute and people aim to do as many burgers possible together with the robot. Uh, they were getting extra money for extra burgers. So there was this incentive. Um, and we recruited something like 109 participants and we worked with three different modes. The first one was the least limiting advisor. That's our method. That's what I showed you, just doing the, the necessary uh, so that we can keep the robot in check. Uh, then there was no advice whatsoever. We just told to the human, these are the rules of the game. This is the aim. Uh, go and do what you feel is the best. And then we came up with strict advice, and this is the, the black arrow there. We were basically telling the human what is the next step they should be taking at all times. And the results are that when we compare our least limiting advisor to the strict advice, our method was perceived as safer, the robot was perceived as more intelligent, it was perceived as more compliant. While compared to no advice, we saw less safety violations. So issuing advice is effective. Issuing it in this mathematically defined least limiting way is better for people than telling them every single step. So that's basically where we got in this, uh, in this setup. And I'm thinking that the only thing I'm going to say on the scalability of multi-robot co coordination is that we tried to apply the same philosophy in the settings where we had multiple robots 
and we wanted to coordinate them as a team. And we didn't want to do it in a centralized way. So we we apply this assume guarantee synthesis on every robot separately. And then, then, then we made them to exchange the assumptions. And it was quite effective. And what you can see here is that uh, with respect to the number of robots, the computational demands don't grow exponentially, they grow linearly. So this um, this kind of assume guarantee synthesis has different uses. So uh, that brings me to the takeaways. So what I tried to introduce here is to uh, is assume guarantee formal synthesis as an alternative to fully adversarial viewpoint on multi-agent interaction in partially controllable settings and as an alternative to fully cooperative viewpoint on multi-agent uh, interaction in fully collaborative settings. Future good work, more games. This is called Mad Games. There is dynamic. We, we are not so dynamic yet. But we are heading that way. We want to use STL. We want to, to use more complex logics, more complex systems. And with that, I would like to thank you all for listening. We can take some uh, questions from the mic. That there's a microphone just behind. Just, there are people online. Uh, thank you, Will. One more talk. Uh, question about the visibility of them. Do you mean by creating the general block uh, like this as an alternative function, or do you have to rely on the Uh It's it's zero one for now. So it's uh. Yeah, it's zero one. Uh, so if I reach the set yes. So in this case, there might be some sparse to your uh, synthetic work. Um, I'm wondering how to address the situation with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we were, indeed, we were working with uh, almost surely objectives. So we are trying to, to get there almost surely. and. I have no idea how to how to work with with anything else for now. Huh? Mm -hmm. So, so I have a question too. So, as you so you move from this grid world to uh, say a system with some dynamics, where do you think you have like the scalability bottleneck? Um, I think the scalability bottleneck will be on the abstraction level. I think that we will have to go through the discrete layer somehow uh, if we want to apply this type of approaches. And then coming from the dynamical model to the abstraction that is truthful enough, but small enough, I think that that may be a bottleneck and it will lead to some conservativeness there. Hmm. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, one of the things was just about the problem with the non state term that we produced when we have this I was wondering if there were other problems that uh, uh, could possibly Yeah, um, I think that one of the problems will be definitely that this is not turn based situation. The time is continuous. So I think this is going to be another big challenge next to the scalability that we have to switch to continuous time somehow or at least concurrent games or something. So, yeah. Mm. Thank you. In fact, there's all this um, do you have any idea how how do you get there? How do you look at that abstraction from the abstraction? Yeah. I think not not really. I think that we are trying to use the user studies to tell us how how close we are in a way to um so I think that you know when it comes to humans. It's going to be very difficult to to work with something like optimality. Um, it's more going to be acceptability by many. Um, so I think that there will always be a gap, right? So you cannot really model a human being. We do not model a human. We just model what change they can make to the environment. And then we try to issue the advice to them. So we are trying to avoid modeling of the human explicitly. That answers your question. Yeah. 
yes yes that's precisely where we are headed i think we're just trying to approach this space of provably correct and socially acceptable in some systematic way uh yeah but it's ltlf double exponential but that's with respect to size of the formula because you need to bring the dfa in and usually the you know i think that this is theoretical bottleneck but when you think about the formulas you want to use you rarely hit that the bottleneck is on the size of the bookie or the size of the dfa so i think the 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 bottleneck on the scalability will be really in in the more on the environmental and, and modeling the individual agents because we really try to keep everything decentralized. Hmm. Thank you. All right, great. We are right on time. Thank, Thank you. Let's give you another one. Great. That was a, a, a really good way to get the day started. So uh, so next up we'll have uh, uh, 